I'd like to start this with a short bit of animation by Randy Haycock. As it plays, I'm isolating all the different hand poses. If you draw characters, I really think that drawing good hand poses should be among your top priorities. Hands give us an important insight into someone's personality or attitude. Hands change pose constantly. They're perhaps more expressive than any other part of the body. Hand poses can give artists fits though, because there's gesture, perspective, 3D construction, and character all crammed into a relatively small space. This video will help you find your way around these skills. So, chapter one, grid hands. In my last hands video, which a bunch of you saw by the way, so that's great, we began with this basic grid drawing exercise. We took something simple to draw, like a flat grid in perspective, and then started slowly adding complexity to it. So getting that little hump right is not just about the outer contours. I have to get this bit of sneaky foreshortening here and make sure the grid lines keep their natural flow over the whole thing. Bending the grid like this approximates a common pose that fingers make. Be sure to keep those grid lines looking parallel. And from this new perspective, we can see both sides of the grid. I'm using that ghosted line right there to track my way through the form. This exercise will help you develop some foundational drawing tools, which is especially important with hands. We're gonna take it to the next level now though, and make the grid more in the shape of a hand. Simple enough, but let's also add the thumb shape. Drawing this grid hand would look something like this. Now, those lines do not represent fingers. It's still just a grid. See how I'm curving these lines though? That does correspond with a hand. It's my Wi-Fi principle from the last video. Just to quickly recap, if you plot a line along the fingertips, you can see how that same line can be transposed down to the base of the fingers. It works on the other side too. Line along the fingertips, and the knuckle line is like a flattened version of that curve. And the middle of the fingers is like a medium version of that curve. The Wi-Fi principle. So this is probably the simplest hand pose to start with, and I recommend you give this hand grid exercise a try for yourself. Using the Wi-Fi principle immediately makes it look like a hand. And for the thumb, just try and make those lines continuous with the rest of the grid. Try a similar open pose on the other side of the hand. Remember to use the Wi-Fi principle here too. For the thumb, I'll approximate the shape. But on this side of the hand, I will try to include this bulbous muscle group that is connected to the thumb. Then I'll use my grid lines to help describe a round form. Now, don't be worried about anatomy or proportion yet. Just approximate it. Okay, when you're ready, take the leap into inventing your own hand grids. A big challenge with drawing hands is getting the volume right. But the grid eliminates that. Instead, it helps you focus on flow and gesture. And those are the things that make the hand look alive. This hand pose reads to me like someone who is casually talking. Remember that Wi-Fi principle? And try bending and warping that grid, indicating kind of a raised pinky finger in this part, but on a more subtle level, just a general flow through the hand, like it's not flat as a board. Throwing up some reference again, let's play with fingers that are bent. Much like our basic grid exercise, in this one we can see the top side and bottom side of the grid, representing both sides of the hand. The Wi-Fi principle is harder to see in these poses, but it is still there. Those curves are related, and massing in a quick value can help show the dimension of the grid. To bridge the gap into imagination, try changing just a part of the pose. Here I'm exaggerating the curvature that the fingertips kind of already have in the reference, but it creates a totally new hand pose as a result. No reference again, and this time I'll play with some foreshortening. Again, because you're not dealing with volume so much, you'll find yourself much more free to create and experiment. I'm using that ghosted line, which is underneath the surface, yet it really helps me track the form. And I find it a helpful visualization exercise to twist the grid so you can see under it in parts. After a few of these, you should start feeling the flow. I mean, the literal flow. Those smooth gestural lines that are so good at capturing the spirit of hand poses. Trying a variation on that last one, kind of a cartoony aha kind of pose. I can feel the tension in that index finger as it pushes itself upwards. That means we've captured something real and the study is successful. And here I'm just trying to bend the thumb so it's different than the last one. Okay, on to chapter two, 3D construction. And once again, we'll start with a basic exercise and build up to more advanced studies from there. Just fill a page with boxes and cylinders. I'm trying to create a variety of 3D forms, but with a little bit of character and all from imagination. 
Some forms are independent, others are grouped and overlapping and leaning on each other, different angles and perspectives. These are all things that the forms of the hands do all the time. So studies like this are great because they take the pressure off drawing while still honing important skills. All right, moving on. The base section of the hand simplifies down into a box. On the dorsal side here, when those fingers bend, the top of that box stays flush with the knuckles. That's not true on the palmer side though. Here's the same box that represents this area, but when the fingers bend now, the top of that box is way out of place. We would have to draw a bento box, I mean a bent box, to represent this. This is due to a simple fact that often gets overlooked. The base of the fingers on the palmer side appears different than the base of the fingers on the dorsal side. We've got to move that line all the way back here. There's a cheat code for this. The first fold in the palm of our hand is where the knuckles are on the other side. So it's this area here that squishes when the fingers bend. The fingers themselves can be simplified into three cylinders. Notice how I'm accounting for the difference in base position here. It's worth noting that on the palmer side, the finger joints and corresponding cylinders fall conveniently on thirds. On the dorsal side, the fingers appear longer because we can see their full length. So it makes more sense to split the finger in half to find the proportions from this view. The areas between the fingers take the form of little valleys and webbing as it transitions to the flesh on the palmer side of the hand. To do some basic practice on fingers, start with tapered cylinders. You know, wider at the bottom, thinner at the top. I'll break it into three sections because we're seeing it from the palmer side. That was simple enough. Let's bend the finger and try it again. Look what happens this time though. The top and bottom of the middle cylinder kind of gets warped a bit. That's because these are organic forms, not rigid ones. Flesh stretches over bone, you know. All right, let's try the same pose here, but a little more foreshortened this time. To get a hair more advanced with the cylinder, you can actually break it into a kind of box too. That's what I'm doing with these red lines. Boxes are beneficial because then you get top and side planes and some basic shading can help clarify that. All right, let's try another pose, and this time we'll draw all the fingers as cylinders. Notice how large portions of these fingers are hidden, either by themselves or by other fingers. A lot of beginning artists will shy away from that and draw very unnatural hands. It is hard to draw, and this is why we did the basic geometry exercise first. Also, don't ever forget that Wi-Fi principle. All right, there's an important thing to learn about this third cylinder. Apart from me needing moisturizer, the fingernail dips in from the main cylinder and then is relatively flat. So let's say you're drawing a finger like this from the side. If you just get that little dip in, it instantly looks more like a finger and with the perspective indicated too. Now, when you see the fingernail in more perspective, like this, you could still think of that flat base and the dip down from the main body of the cylinder. So let's draw this larger. There's that dip down. Fingernail is relatively flat on top. It does have a bit of curvature, but the fingernail largely sits on the top plane of this cylinder slash box. Now, of course, with hand poses, you're going to see fingers from all kinds of angles. These fingers circled here, we're seeing from kind of a front on view, more or less. They're all quite foreshortened anyway. Right now, I'm drawing the index finger from the photograph, and I'm using that fingernail as my primary way of showing the perspective on that finger. Notice how it's got that flat profile on top versus the roundness of the flesh at the bottom of the finger. It's the same with the thumbnail. These are the flat lines I'm talking about here. Now, they're not perfectly flat. Again, they have some roundness, but they mostly define the top plane of these fingers. So these lines alone can be a really helpful tool in figuring out the perspective you're dealing with. Now I'm drawing the cartoon hand on the upper left. Don't let the word cartoon fool you. This is a difficult drawing. Each finger is seen from slightly different angles, which means different amounts of fingernail. So I'm really aware of the level of flatness there to indicate the different perspectives. Now, thankfully, when the fingers are more square to the camera, they become a lot easier to draw. Just get those proportions in, and the fingernail is kind of like a garden spade shape. I know, lots of information. Let's take a break and hear a word from our sponsor. Tell me if this sounds familiar. You're a creative person, and life seems to be getting more and more full of creative projects to keep track of. For me, it's YouTube, planning new classes, paintings I want to get to. I used to do this the old school way, but lately I've been using Milanote to help me out with all of it. Check this out. Milanote is a boarding tool, like a whiteboard on steroids. 
I've got an overview of my ongoing creative projects. I can click into them to see each project's custom board. This here is my woodworking side business. Yep, it actually exists. My board helps me keep track of inventory and progress with current orders. I've got an inspiration board here for future products. My YouTube ideas are nested here. I'll keep those a secret. And oh look, here's the hands video you're watching right now. I planned this whole lesson in Milanote. I've got a mood board going in here. I visually brainstormed with pictures and references. I think of all this as like a living document. It evolves as I work. Keeping track of creative projects is challenging, but Milanote makes it a whole lot easier with a hundred built-in templates for designers, photographers, filmmakers, and more. Collaborate with co-creators. You can use Milanote on your desktop or use the app. Milanote is available for free and with no time limit. Sign up using the link in the description and start your next creative project. All right, Milanote is indeed great. But getting back to the palm, we already know that the upper part bends and squishes with the fingers. But to add a bit more complexity, I'm sorry, this area can also bend unevenly, simplifying into a box that looks like this. In other words, a bit harder to draw. It's worth doing a 3D construction study of this whole hand, actually. And before I go anywhere with those fingers, I'm connecting the Wi-Fi, and now I'm free to construct these cylinders on top of that palm box. Again, splitting them into thirds in this view, and gonna finish it off with a bit of shading to show the undersides of things. I left that thumb blank because we're gonna talk about the thumb right now. There's a sneaky little muscle here that's attached to the thumb. So I like to group it in with the overall thumb shape. So from the dorsal side, that shape looks something like this. We'll plot two points and track them around the hand. And on the palmer side, the thumb shape includes that round muscle group. Sure, it's anatomically complex, but its bulbous shape is simple. I've seen a lot of artists struggle with the orientation of the thumb. Its angle is quite different from the rest of the fingers. Yes, the thumb can become coplanar with the fingers, but it takes a lot of effort to do that. The thumb likes to hang out in this region. It's got a very different dominion than the rest of the fingers. The key to mapping out the thumb in your drawings is to use the L shape created by these three joints. Even in a real life hand, you can see these joints pretty easily, and the lines between them are pretty straight. Animators often make this L shape super clear in order to emphasize structure in an otherwise simple shape. This L shape trick, well, it's a backwards L here, is especially useful when the thumb is extended outward from the hand. And while we're on the dorsal side, remember to place that middle joint of the L far enough out to make room for this muscle. It takes up quite a bit of real estate between the index finger and the thumb. Poses and angles like this are harder. We'll have to employ our full tool set to figure this out. You can always start with the hand grid, get that gesture going. I've also mapped out cylinders for the fingers and the palm box. Now, even though that L shape is less clear, I can still see those three joints and therefore can find my way into the thumb. Another helpful tip is to track the muscle mound on the palmer side to make sure its bulbous shape rhythmically connects to the dorsal side. And one more tip I find helpful, the skin fold coming off the thumb, if you were to extend it, it more or less connects with the bottom plane of the index finger. So we used our full arsenal of tools to figure that one out. We are now ready to draw. And my first drawing will be the world's most ubiquitous pose, holding a phone. It's not too long here before I get the Wi-Fi plugged in. On the right there is what I'm thinking about versus what I'm actually drawing. For example, I'm thinking about how the cylinder of the index finger would connect with the palm box. I didn't actually need to draw it though. Also, my simple shading here is directly influenced by the boxes and cylinders. I'm shading side planes and back planes. Pose-wise, I really enjoy how we use our pinky finger as a support base for the phone to sit on, and the other fingers kind of cradle it. If you've ever studied animation, you probably know that Milt Call is the master of hands. So many professional animators look up to him. I'm laying in a gesture here. This gesture, though, is half hand grid, half 3D construction. You know, you use what you need from these tools. The Wi-Fi curves were embedded in my gesture, so I'm just kind of following them as I now lay in the fingers. This hand is gesturing toward the viewer, which, of course, is extremely common, and that often causes some degree of foreshortening. In this example, it's the palm box that's foreshortened, something like this. In my actual drawing, look how little of that bottom plane you can see. But you can still see it, because we're looking ever so slightly up at this hand. So the 3D construction practice is invaluable for figuring this out. See how that index finger is doing something different than the rest of the hand? 
That's another very common thing you'll see with hand poses. The index finger kind of taking the lead, and therefore breaking off into its own shape and gesture, while the other fingers are bunched up and overlapping and grouped together, sharing a gesture. Just a quick aside here, this index lead thing is a great go-to pose when you just need something casual and you're not trying to draw attention to the hands, yet you still want them to be drawn well. All right, this hand is a good one to show you a fun little perspective tip. So we have the palm box, right? But in reality, that box has curvature to it. Because of that, it's amazing how often the middle knuckle will be connected with the silhouette, not the index knuckle. Logically, you'd probably think the hand should be drawn like this, but this is often incorrect. It's usually more accurate this way. Just a short video here. Look at how quickly the middle knuckle overtakes the index knuckle in perspective. I put this in my drawings all the time. Oh good, here's one of my daughter's t-shirts. Minnie's hand is really nicely drawn. I'm gonna start off with a hand grid gesture type thing. This hand has minimal detail, it's all about flow. Those fingers are nicely offset, and the cylinders diagram there is how I'm thinking about it. Those three characteristic Mickey Mouse lines at the base of the hand, those are just parts of the hand grid made visible. And just to check my work, I'm tracking that bulbous muscle on the other side of the hand, just to see if it feels right flow-wise. Mickey Mouse character's hands are certainly not beneath me. They're very good practice. Speaking of practice, here's something you can try to help bridge the gap between reference and imagination. I'm using some photo reference, but my hand will have completely different physical attributes. Oh, there's the Wi-Fi. In order to pull this off design-wise, I'm basically looking for any fleshy area, like underneath the fingertips, the squishy area of the palm, the round thumb muscle group, and I'm exaggerating the roundness in those areas. I feel like this hand would be very hard to draw if we hadn't just done the whole lesson before this. With those tools, this hand is actually pretty easy. If you notice, I didn't even really have to build forms or work out a gesture. I just went straight for the 2D. And that is something to work towards. It comes with experience. When drawing the hand very flexed, the fingers are basically as straight as they're ever gonna get. The thumb, however, goes further. It can bend back quite a bit. This poses a perspective difficulty and a pretty cool drawing tip. But first, we've got the thumb moving around here. Rewind a bit. Now, I'm gonna use this shape to track the top plane of the thumb as it moves. So here we go, you ready? Moving, moving, moving. Keep your eye on it. Okay, right there. The bottom plane has started to take over, as you'd expect, but the top plane is still visible. Even here, the top plane refuses to fully go away. Because it's extremely common for the thumb to be extended like that, you're gonna be dealing with this constantly. So here's my little tip to draw it fast and accurately. First, work out the L shape, then gesture up to the tip of the thumb. Once you find its placement, you can draw in a fleshy circular pad like this. Now here's the secret. Out from behind that fleshy pad comes the main joint of the thumb, the top plane that is sneaking through. It's kind of a soft upside down V shape. So that's how you draw this in a more common three quarter perspective. All right, let's see if I can pull out a showstopper for this last one. This will be a heavily foreshortened wizard casting magic pose. We all need to draw those, right? So I like to combine the hand grid with a bit of 3D construction. For me, that's a great way to get started. So that's my block in, which I'll now continue the drawing on top of. See these folds in the palm I'm putting in? Those are grid lines going over the form. For these two fingers, the cylinders that break the finger into thirds really help me find the foreshortening. The other two fingers that I'm working on now are seen from the other side, the dorsal side. So for those, I like to find the middle point between the knuckles and the fingertips. Of course, that ring finger is bent, so the middle point appears lower. To show the flex on a finger, you can bend them back a little bit, like you see on the index finger here, even a little on the pinky. Just reserve the most bend for the thumb. And I hope you noticed that the thumb is drawn with the perspective tip I just showed you. And that should just about do it for this lesson. I'd like to mention that I have a big drawing class in the works. It's aimed at experienced beginners, and it's on discounted presale right now at marcobucciartstore.com. Thanks for watching everyone, I hope this was helpful, and I'll see you in the next video.